People always say to start your day with some nice meditation or maybe journaling, but me, I say start your day with a hot ass story from Dipsy and I 10 out of 10 recommend that you do the same. Absolutely. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. They use immersive soundscapes and realistic characters, and you have so many stories to choose from. There's literally something for everyone. For example, there's even a growing library of fantasy series with vampires, Greek gods, and fairy smut to explore the bounds of your pleasure. Like, how fun? Are you kidding me? <laughs> We've been using Dipsy for literal years, and it has remained one of our favorite tools to use inside the bedroom. And also outside, if you're just <laughs> bored and want, you know, a spike of arousal. Dipsy is my favorite way to spice up a masturbation session, or if I'm feeling like I just want to give myself a really immersive, fun experience. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I recommend the Sebastian and Benj stories. Mm. I'm mm -hmm. blushing just thinking about them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Also worth mentioning are their soothing sleep stories, wellness sessions, and their sexy written stories that you can read. Like what more could you even ask for? For listeners of the show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash do me. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash D-E-W-M-E. That's dipsystories.com slash do me. Hello, welcome to Honey Do Me. I'm Cass. I'm Emma. And this is our podcast about how to have good, kinky sex. This month we're this getting month. <laughs> very, very kinky. We're not always kinky, but in October, we are. Um, <laughs> not always kinky, but when I am, it's October. <laughs> it's October for sure. Uh, yeah, kink is our theme for this month of episodes, and we're so excited mm -hmm. about it. I... This is genuinely probably my favorite collection of episodes we've ever yeah. done. Like they're so fun and so good and so mind blowing. <laughs> so they go there. Mm -hmm. That's what I love about them. Yeah. And we're really starting it off with a goddamn bang. Oh, bang, bang, bang. <laughs> Oh, I was gonna make. Oh, never mind. That's a good one, though. Um, yes. And so today we are speaking with Eva O, mm -hmm. also known as uh, Mistress Eva. She's a professional international dominatrix and intimidating and amazing. So cool, better than me. Beautiful, she's intelligent, so all the cool. things. Oh my God, she's mm -hmm. so cool. Just the entire time, she was blowing our minds. Mm -hmm. Um. In a way that applies in the bedroom, but also just to life in general. I feel like everything that she says is just so applicable to everything that we do. And yeah, you mm -hmm. might not be, you know, telling someone to undress in your everyday life in a dominating way, but you might. <laughs> but you might. And you might stumble upon that one of these days. I've actually been reciting to myself, and it's going to be just a small insight into the episode, mm -hmm. but... She, we talk a lot about shame and kind of feeling silly and dumb, like all the topics that we go over usually when it comes to things that we do in the bedroom that we're not typically comfortable with. Um, but the way Eva describes embracing feelings that make us uncomfortable and chalking it up to being a human and kind of playing mm -hmm. with that, I have been embracing recently as I've felt uncomfortable in my body and mind. <laughs> In my mind, body, and soul. <laughs> and it's just a very beautiful message as to how to operate and appreciate being a human and all that it means, even mm -hmm. when it's really uncomfortable. So not only is she a dominatrix, she's a wisdom giver. Yeah. I don't know. A life coach. A life a coach, life if coach. you will. Yeah. yeah. I feel like that's one of my big takeaways from this episode, too, is... Like, yes, it's like kinky and fun and cool, but this episode is really beautiful. Like it is a very beautiful episode. <laughs> poetic. That it uh -huh. is poetic in like yeah. this very unexpected way that's like, holy shit, that mm -hmm. does make me rethink how I've been existing. Mm-hmm. And then if you want the spice, we also get into what a session with a dominatrix, yes. specifically Eva O, would look like. And um speechless at the end, uh -huh. I guess. Uh -huh. It was wonderful. I'm so excited for you guys to start off kink month like this. Yeah. And we have a lot more in store this month. We have bondage. We have communication. We have 
pet play, <laughs> which play. is something I didn't even know we would ever talk about. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. and it's a very fun month. So it really is. For now, we'll see you on the other side of this episode. Um, bye. Bye. But we're here to talk about being a dominatrix and being more dominant in the bedroom, which is one of our favorite topics, but also one of the areas that I feel like we struggle with the most. Um, right. So that's why we are so excited to talk to you today. I wanted to start out by asking, what do you think makes a good dom? What do I think makes a good dominatrix? Um, a working one or one in a, a private sense? Let's do both. Yeah, let's do both. Okay. I think privately, it's probably um, something that's useful just to be a human in general, to be able to understand your perspective, your needs, and have space to hold the perspective of somebody else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's probably the yeah. number one in a private sense. And then in a business sense, um, what's the most important thing? <laughs> I think obviously that skill set is useful, but then uh, having great boundaries. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Do because you you're toying like- with um, a lot of uh, personal headspaces and so and you're using your own also. And so in order to manage that it takes a lot of work. Yeah. Right. Do you mm. feel like your boundaries get um, either questioned or pushed a lot in a professional sense as a dom? <laughs> <laughs> or just jumping right in. <laughs> yes. So I would like to say that things have changed over the years, but no. <laughs> <laughs> people because like I just said everything is about toying with somebody's intimate spaces and a lot of the times they are with you in this BDSM space and they don't do that anywhere else and so the way that they tend to connect to you becomes a little bit intense and sometimes that can mean that the professional boundaries get pushed yeah right mm. Do you think that that's the same also for a private setting, like having the responsibility of being like, let's say you set up a scene with your partner and you're the dom Mm. and they're the sub. Do you feel like your own internal boundaries kind of get pushed and moved around if you're like exploring dom play in the bedroom? I think that it is, of course, a possibility. But when you're doing it professionally, you have to manage that in such great mass. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. So, I mean, it's one it's it's definitely difficult when it's an intimate relationship because sometimes you don't have the space to think. Mm-hmm. But uh, so that's going to be definitely the hazy space. But when you have to do it with so many people, it can be tiring. Yeah. Yeah. yeah mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. What do you feel like? gets in the way of um, like, let's go back to personal Hmm. setting Mm -hmm. and someone who's maybe just starting to try out um, playing with being dominant in the bedroom. What are some hurdles that beginners (laughs) deal with, uh, with being dominant in the bedroom? (laughs) We get in our own way, don't we? (laughs) Yes. Chronically and all the time. (laughs) That is the main hurdle. Mm -hmm. I think, um, Yeah, I think having a dialogue in your head and not paying attention to to the ability that is in front of you is our major issue in life. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But I think in order to overcome that, there are many little tricks and tips that I've realized can work over time. I think that obviously having a train of thought that is more supporting of yourself is very helpful, but bar that it's a new thing it's very challenging to maybe step into this headspace let's let's see where we can go with it i think to define a a defined period of time like an hour or even half an hour or even the next 15 minutes saying that i'm going to just simply ask and they they will accept or deny very uh with enthusiasm yeah i think that having a practice can kind of elongate that time for mm-hmm. you, yeah, you can become accustomed to seeing how that power dynamic actually can play out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. there are ways. Yeah. 
can you, to get over ourselves. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> can you talk a little bit about how you might have applied those techniques professionally and like your journey to becoming a professional dominatrix? Mm. I think for me, my dialogue was about uh, making men think that it was their idea. <laughs> Because I, I was love that. always um, <laughs> assertive and always aware of what it is that I wanted from sex, from life, from what was right in front of me. And that was obviously very helpful. But in the day to day, at least when I was starting to grow up like 20 or 30 years ago, it was not available to a woman to be able to make that happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It, you can't just say what it is that you think. You have to maneuver the world around you in order for them to think that that's what you should be doing. Yeah. And so I had to get over that, but I got over it very quickly. <laughs> because when you are in an environment where all of these men, uh, a lot of the time it is a lot of uh, male clients, they are interested in you directing something. And that's like the validation and the payment for it over and over and over again. It's, it's a very quick that you can get to a space of, hey, this is welcome. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that filtered actually into my day-to-day -day life. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I feel like that's a, that was the secret is making men believe it's their idea. I <laughs> can imagine that that's fail-proof. <laughs> you know, most men <laughs> would... I think uh, it's still useful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I waste less time these days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. If I don't need to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With container space, um, mm -hmm. you're saying like setting an initial boundary of time. Mm -hmm. What does that help with? Is that just so you're like, okay, I just got to think of things to say for 10 minutes and then I can mm -hmm. be done. What does the container help? I think that when people are asking me about how they can bring it into their lives, and I suggest that, I think what it does is it gives them permission, one, which I think is quite important. Mm -hmm. I think that it is less intimidating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that well, I, it, it creates a space for negotiation also and like a, a dialogue. I think that, oh, between the person that you're going to be practicing with, like mm -hmm. to get into the habit of saying, this is what we're doing for this period of time, I think is very useful aside from being dominant or not. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah. And I think just having that feedback loop and again, it, letting the time elongate into your psyche, I think mm -hmm. is, is probably the reasoning for that suggestion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that definitely would help. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there any other general practices that you recommend newbies take into account or maybe just like practicing in general? How do we do that? Um, yeah. General disclaimers. <laughs> well, I think first, I love to know that people are interested in finding satiation and looking outside of what is expected. I think that's probably an amazing thing when I first hear that people are interested. And I think they need to commend themselves on that first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I think that it's useful to be informed, to see what's possible. Yeah. Whether that's looking on sites like kinkacademy.com, where they go through a lot of different techniques and um, they might talk about the psychology of things. I think that can help you understand what it is that might be interesting for you. Mm -hmm. uh, I think information is probably the, the key thing. And doing it with the person or people that you're interested in potentially exploring that with so that it can be like a conversation piece that's not so intimidating. Also, it's like, what are you interested in? It might be a bit much for, the, for some people the <laughs> first time. Whereas if it's like a third input, it can be... Yeah, it can be less uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. confronting. Also. Yeah. <laughs> I think that can be somewhere good to start. And then also understanding, I guess, what it is that you respond to. Information via a website can be good for people who take it in that way. People might want to watch YouTube videos. People might want to go to a party and see what's available. It depends what you respond to, mm -hmm. I think. And just gathering things so that you understand what it is that you want. So it can yeah. be most successful for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. How important is confidence in exploring this type of play or is it slash can it be a fake it till you make it situation? Because I struggle with confidence. That's where this question is coming from. <laughs> this is a personal <laughs> question. Yeah. Is this for a podcast or yeah. are we recording? <laughs> I, I heard a little bird mention confidence somewhere. <laughs> Just thought I'd ask. <laughs> Listener wrote in. <laughs> I think. <laughs> when I first started, was I confident? I was naive. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I. It was amazing how little I knew. <laughs> now that I think back, but I was driven by the curiosity and the thrill of things. So I guess sometimes other factors can pull you through this imagined um, lack of confidence or an actual lack of confidence. I think that if you can find something to look towards, focus on, you know, like the laughter of something or the pleasure of something, I think that can sometimes help you to create a new pathway as opposed mm -hmm. to just hearing this lack of confidence talk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think acting is also very useful. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, as people walking throughout the world, you put on a, an acting hat, you know, every now and then. What's It is a little bit tempting to think that I don't want to do that in an intimate personal space because I want to be authentic, etc. But sometimes or i kind of believe that acting is simply uh, another facet of of who you can be yeah Definitely. you can try it on yeah uh -huh. if it doesn't work you can leave it behind you know right so it's probably it's probably a few different ways that you can kind of navigate that mm -hmm. yeah well, I really like... What are you going to latch on to <laughs> i really like the focus on something else not just mm. If yeah. you're not confident, work on it. If yeah. you don't have it, fake it all the time mentality. I think it could be yeah. latching on to what you're saying, like pleasure or curiosity, what you can get out of it. Being like, mm. yeah, I'm fucking scared. <laughs> this is, mm. I do not have any confidence in this situation, but I could have an orgasm and that could be oh, fun. Yeah. So we're going to keep going. <laughs> I'm pretty sure a lot of people uh, are, are distracted by that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> For better Absolutely. or for worse. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So in the same like vein as acting, is it something that like is this something we can practice on our own? Like are we looking in the mirror and practicing things that we're gonna say? Is that worth it? Or is that kind of just like not gonna transfer in the same way? Hmm. I think it really depends what it is that you're re reacting to. Like I was mentioning how, how you learn, right? Mm -hmm. I guess I, I run over sessions in my mind sometimes after I've done them. Um, not play by play, but like something that I might have said and I'll just like start laughing like on my own. <laughs> uh <-huh>. <laughs> <laughs> is that reinforcing um, my joy of it? Potentially. I guess it really <laughs> depends how, how you go about things. I think also surrounding yourself with um, people who you would like to emulate is very useful. Yeah. And who are supportive of those aspects of your personality that you would like to have more of or in yourself, yeah, in your time. Uh, when I started to work and find women in this industry and see how no bullshit they were. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It was uh, refreshing, and now I can't be around anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and it enabled me to also work and, and live that aspect of myself that I guess I always wanted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So everyone in your sphere mm -hmm. is completely um, aware of your profession, and, like, are they also a dominatrix or in the, like, sex work profession? Uh. I definitely went through a phase where I was only friendly with sex workers, mm -hmm. but I think over time I've learned how to communicate 
my work so that people not in it can understand and therefore I can connect with them. Mm-hmm. And so now not everybody that I know or I hang out with or call a friend is in sex work, but we are very open. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, need, I think I need people who are ready to, who are not afraid of asking me questions and who are not afraid of asking themselves questions. I think that's my only sort of yeah. requirement these days. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, if we're not growing and learning, you know, <laughs> do you believe Some that? Some people same- don't want to. Yeah. 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 Do you believe that same philosophy applies to everyday friendships um, outside of, mm-hmm. you know, your work and your profession? Like, should we be talking about our sex lives with our friends? Does that help us grow and, you know, support what we want to do in the bedroom, <laughs> I guess? I think that it can definitely be useful. I think it's mm-hmm. incredibly useful to have a community uh, in especially the spaces that are not talked about mm-hmm. uh, because it can get very lonely and you can sometimes go through loops that are very unhelpful if you have no feedback or even something to watch and to understand from. Mm-hmm. But I mean, culturally, it might not be something that is done very freely. There are internet spaces, right? Like forums and podcasts like yours. And so I think it really depends on the cultural framework, whether that's going to be possible. But I think in general, not thinking about our lives is not helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there are some people who don't want to engage Mm -hmm. also. So even though I believe that we would be a better world (laughs) if we questioned ourselves and the world around us and tried to understand these facets, but not everybody wants to do that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. definitely. What you're saying is making me think about how some of us don't ask questions or don't ask ourselves questions or don't question things because we're taught not to and we're encouraged yeah. not to. So I'm kind of yeah. wondering what your thoughts are on how women and other people who are socialized to be more submissive might have shame around being more oh, yeah. dominant. Um, how mm. can we work through that? Mm. So I, this reminds me also earlier on, you said something about fear of, um, yeah, not being confident. So I, I feel like fear, shame live in a similar space mm-hmm. for me, um, in my understanding. Um, I think that as a, a sadomasochist, it can actually be quite interesting to to like sit in fear and and shame. I think that to understand that it's a part of the human experience is it disarms it in in a way for me, but it also <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of enjoyable also and then when it dis- it gets disarmed a little bit then I feel like you're able to look at it from the outside and to start to understand it more and it's kind of nice to be afraid sometimes also I think the more that you shy away from things the more power that they're going to have over you mm-hmm. the more that you can just understand that it's potentially enjoyable I mean, we play with fear and shame and kink all the time, mm-hmm. right? There's a lot of people who are very ashamed of certain aspects of themselves, their bodies, their choices, and they want to explore that in a sexual context in order to, in a private, intimate way, so that they can change the narrative for themselves. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I don't know if shame or fear is necessarily such a terrible thing if you know how to reframe it Mm -hmm, and find spaces that are ready to be there for you within it. I really like the way that you framed that. And it reminds me of a spiritual teacher that I had and she would talk about getting kinky with the universe and like being like, (laughs) oh yeah, is that all you got? Like kind of thing. And I really (laughs) like that frame. It makes it so much more fun and it's still Mm -hmm. scary but it just, yeah. It, yeah, it's a big reframe that I don't think yeah. we're used to. Yeah, I don't know if I have like um, <laughs> easy answers or answers. I'm just talking about the way that I guess I have noticed things in the world. Yeah. 
So don't but, take it as do it. But. <laughs> but you've walked through the world a lot differently than Cass and I have. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I feel like the people we have spoken to in our lives, our day-to-day lives, we walk the same, generally the same life. So it's interesting mm-hmm. to hear a different perspective and it doesn't, yours isn't saying like, don't be scared, don't like, or have yeah. all the confidence in the world. It's so interesting yeah. to hear you talk about the way you deal with these complicated emotions and yeah. still bring them in the bedroom. But could you define sadomasochist for me oh, yeah. and everyone? <laughs> <laughs> so when I say sadomasochism, it's uh, sadism and masochism. So sadism is uh, somebody who, or this concept of enjoying distributing suffering, pain, potential negatives. Yeah. Uh And uh, masochism would be the inverse of that. So the enjoyment of receiving that pain, that suffering. Yeah. The potential negative. And I think that, you know, (laughs) people who constantly torture themselves with cycles of thought, they're, they're, they're fueling it in a way they're masochists to me (laughs) right Mm -hmm. so it's not only in a physical sense i think that it can also happen in a a solo uh emotional sense as well Mm -hmm. but when i say that i am a sadomasochist it means that i personally uh, my translation of that is that i i enjoy life in the way that it presents the pleasure the pain the suffering the joy i for me, it's all about telling me that I'm alive. Yeah. Yeah. And it's enjoyable for me. Were you, <laughs> yeah. were you born that way? Like, how do you become that way? <laughs> <laughs> Masterclass um, right now. Yeah. <laughs> Teach us, please. Uh, how did I become like this? I've always been um, a big observer. Yeah, like watching the world, watching my reactions, watching things happening, as opposed to uh, just going along and getting carried with it. Everything has been, I I have a huge curiosity. And so I think that when I feel something, I'm like, oh, what is that thing? You know, and I've been like that since I was tiny. But then um, because of the curiosity, I ended up doing uh, Vipassana meditation for quite a few years it's definitely petered off now but it was this uh it's an observational style of meditation you just observe and so i think that taught me even more about how to not judge something when i when i feel it hear it think it's more just like just letting it sit and actually then it has more to tell me yeah 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 so yeah, it's a few things, I guess. <laughs> but it's yeah. just so, so brave. <laughs> it's such a brave mm. way to live when you're um, ready to be confronted with everything that gets either thrown at you or that your body is telling you and then look mm. at it and sit with it. A lot of us run or um, doom scroll perhaps or watch TV <laughs> mm. to get away from Mm-mm-mm. those feelings. And I think that has a time and place as well, mm-hmm. but um, it's also another thing to do it like you do it. <laughs> yeah. You, it really needs to be a balance also. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. During Absolutely. this meditation thing, like for example, in the first year or two, I stopped feeling hunger. I didn't under, I didn't translate. I didn't understand what hunger was anymore because it was just another sensation of being. And so I had to teach myself how to, how to like eat properly and everything again. I, I, I'm a little bit intense, I guess, when I do yeah, anything. <laughs> a little bit intense. I don't know. I'm sure that what helps about you, you would say that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot of what I think scares us away from trying things mm-hmm. is the fear of failing or looking stupid. Mm-hmm. So, what would you say to that emotion? And how do we recover if we feel like we've... Interview. <laughs> <laughs> oh You're not the only intense one on the couch. 
This is so, definitely not suited to my uh, very late night, but it's okay. I like it. <laughs> As we have established. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> We're just trying to appeal We're to the just... sadomasochist in you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so it was about, um, can, can, can you um, say that again? Just so I'm yeah. clear on what it is that you're. Um, like we're, I feel like I would be scared of messing up if I was going to mm. play with being dominant in the bedroom. So mm. how should we reframe that? And then how do you also recover if you feel like you have messed up or embarrassed yourself in the bedroom? I mean, I laugh at myself all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I'm lucky that I guess I, I had a conversation actually the other day with a few friends and my friend was looking very uh, embarrassed about something. And I was like uh, asking the table what, when was the last time that they felt ashamed and how often does that happen? I don't think that I understand how to um, feel that because of the same reason, right? Because I feel like uh, I don't see anything wrong with feeling it. It's just that maybe my threshold is um, a little bit different because if I mess up, I, it's amusing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm human. What, what, what was expected, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I guess I can laugh at how that can be. I think a practice of maybe um, being with people around you who are not going to shame you, I think is probably very useful. I think people who can like chuckle at, at you and be like, yeah, whatever. And then next we move on is probably like a, a way to support yourself in being able to do that. But I mean, I've set hair on fire in my oh. <laughs> sessions before. <laughs> oh my God. That's, that's something. <laughs> so, you know, it. like you mess up, yeah. but you rectify it as soon as you can. <laughs> And the next session, it was a couple client. Uh, they brought me like a little fire extinguisher as a joke. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this, this so is funny. life. Like um, yeah. I was a professional, but th even in those scenarios, I think you can try to be prepared as best as you can. So like mm -hmm. if you want to think about safety, do your first aid. If you want to think about doing more like uh, dominating in the bedroom, maybe see what you can research, do a course, do like a role play. I think be ar around people, in, like interact with a partner that you can have that laughter with when either of you mess up, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that you can have honest feedback with. Maybe just try it with somebody more neutral mm -hmm. first. Yeah, like a friend. They, like both of you can just try with each other. Yeah, it doesn't have to be sexual. It can even just be, I need you to make me a drink exactly like this. And then I would like you to bring it to me and like sit in this position and then give it to me, you know? And then like vice versa, like try to do it, I guess, in a way that isn't intimidating mm -hmm. to you yeah. first and like practicing, practicing things that way. But I mean, everyone messes up. Yeah. This is normal. And it's Sometimes ridiculous. We set people's it's hilarious. Hair on fire, you, know? you know, a lot of the times, it's, as long as people are not getting permanently injured, you know, yeah. hair goes back. <laughs> <laughs> and hair grows back. That's so funny. Yeah. I think that would be a fun um, task for you and I, Cass, mm -hmm. to have, because I think that helps just build strong individuals too, is being able to ask mm -hmm. for what you want without feeling guilty for saying or for knowing exactly what you want. Mm -hmm. um, and so Cass, you and I, I feel like are over thinkers in terms of like, oh God, I sounded like such an asshole, like asking for that or, you know, being like, yeah, but it's okay. Never mind. Don't worry. Like mm -hmm. exclamation point type of situation. So that would be a fun thing for you and I to do. I agree. Yeah. I say sorry <laughs> when I ask for something. A lot of the time I'll be like, oh, I'm oh, so yeah. sorry. Can you do this for me? Even with my husband. And he actually pointed yeah. it out to me like two days ago. And he's like, 
you got to fucking stop saying sorry when you ask me to do something or saying like, oh, I feel so guilty for asking you to do this because like I asked him to make me a snack in like the middle of the night. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh, like I feel guilty. I'm sorry. I know you have to get up for work. And he's like, I, I want to do it for you. So stop fucking saying you feel guilty. And he's saying it yeah. in a really nice way. But I, yeah. I'm realizing now how often I apologize when I ask for something. And I'm okay. not asking for it in a mean way. I'm just asking for something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah do you not like that that you ask that you say sorry I'm gonna be really honest and this is gonna make me I think look a little bit like a bitch but I think I say it more to like make the other person think that I'm like super nice and like accommodating like I'm not actually sorry I don't actually yeah. feel guilty but I want you to think yeah. that I like do you get what I'm oh, saying, Emma? You're shaking your head. Like, do you no, get what I I'm totally trying to get say? It. It's very <laughs> interesting. Yeah. So when you're actually, asked... you want them to perceive you in a way that you aren't. Yeah. 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 I think so. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> because yeah. I know what I'm asking isn't that big of a fucking deal. And no. if you were to ask me, I would do it. So no, I'm not sorry, but <laughs> that will cushion the way I'm asking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's probably more like a perception of self issue, right? Oh, I'm yeah. sure. I'm yeah. absolutely sure. <laughs> Surely. You have less um, less problems with assertion than you may uh, have let on. Perhaps. <laughs> Maybe I have a problem with my level of assertiveness um, mm, yeah. and try to cushion that. So yeah. that's something that yeah. I'm, I'm going to check in about. Yeah, I think it's about like finding people who are really happy to serve that. Yeah. And that you can see the obvious joy that they're getting from being told what to do or fulfilling something for you. Mm-hmm. It's just about fit, I think, in that case. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. As, <laughs> I, uh, you know, my closest partners, I don't, I do throw in a please and a thank you. But for the most part, I like service-based relationships where, you know, the acts of service thing, where that's the main focus of the exchange. And also culturally, like when you speak um, the languages I grew up with, nobody says, please, like, it's not, I didn't even know what that word was (laughs) until like (laughs) I learned it formally. (laughs) So it's, it's like a, a few things that are happening, but, but when you people get something out of doing things for other people. A lot of people do. Yeah. Actually, everyone does on some level, right? So I guess if you wanted to feel into that you're grateful for what somebody is doing, then understand and know that a lot of people are wanting to actually do something for you. But if you just want to get more comfortable with the fact that you want the world around you in a way that you know what you want then I guess that's just being more honest with oneself. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's a very fair point. Fair. Yeah, that hits for sure. For sure. I got angry though. I used to get really angry when I was like more like that though. Does that happen to you? Like, yeah. Cass has a knowing look. (laughs) Yeah. It might. It might. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, oh, that's so yeah. funny. This is going uh, such a different direction than I originally expected, and I'm so grateful for it because you're definitely like shifting my perspective on more than just like life okay. in the bedroom. You're like shifting my perspective oh. on life in general. But yeah, this is okay. hitting in ways I did not expect, and I am deeply appreciative. Get angry, <laughs> yeah, that too. It's all connected, though. I mean, yeah, it really is live. Yeah, it's all the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. Um, speaking with you, I feel like busts a lot of myths about what a dominatrix is or should be in terms of serious and scary and intimidating. You're intimidating be- because you're so cool, um, but you're very like laughy and engaging, and like this is the conversation that we're having. So, is there okay. any myths about? being a dominatrix or being dominant in the bedroom. Like you can't laugh, you can't be silly, you can't, those types of things. 
Well, I think you'd have to tell me what the myths are, and then I can tell you not. But <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm definitely Fair. scary. Is it because I'm cool? That's that's really nice. <laughs> I, I think, think that so. I have no, I have no um, bullshit. Yeah, I think that's mm -hmm. probably the scariest thing about me. I will uh -huh. tell my, I, I mean, I'm more careful, obviously, when I just. Uh, have a friend relationship or I'm just meeting people, but people who are serving me, people who are in relationship with me, uh -huh. uh, I don't really have so much of a filter unless I think it's necessary in order for you to understand it better. Uh, otherwise, I'm very direct. And I think that's probably the most terrifying thing because mm -hmm. people don't want to hear, <laughs> hear a reality. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. That's my best skill. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> when it comes to my work. I think uh -huh. all different people who dom, are, it's going to look very different. Yeah. Uh -huh. But maybe that is a nice blanket way of understanding what might be a misconception and how to bolster that. But some people laugh. Some people never uh -huh. laugh. Some people don't ever touch someone. Some people are all about the erotic. It's all over the place yeah it just depends on the personality of the person and the way that they want to position themselves mm -hmm. yeah so yeah. it can be all the things that I am and that I'm not yeah 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 so it's about finding what fits for you um in mm -hmm. the bedroom and like do you do you have one style and people go to you for your style or mm -hmm. does it adjust per um, like person that comes to see you per partner? Mm, it always shifts and it shifts also over time with the same people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I do have a little bit of an approach when I first meet somebody. It's probably a little bit more on the, it's always probably intense <laughs> and like <laughs> focused and uh -huh. I watch them very closely, tell them what I think. It's probably always that. But it's definitely more erotic in the beginning, and then it peters out <laughs> when the relationship oh. develops more. Because uh -huh. they get so invested in your being that you can almost do less. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> That's yeah. great. Which is something funny that I've, I've noticed. But I forgot the initial question, because now I'm thinking about how <laughs> lazy oh, I've yeah. become. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> No, you're answering it perfectly. I think yeah. that's so, it evolves. Um, yeah. Because like you said, you're an observer. So I feel like mm -hmm. that makes sense that it would uh, evolve with uh, your partners. Yeah, yeah. And people, in general, I like people to be attentive. And so I do shift in terms of how to make that happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's my main interest. So I guess it's about our own selves understanding what it is that we want to get out of something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if that's a consistency of character, then that's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if it's going to be something more like how I adjust in order to get a certain result, that also works. Yeah. yeah. Could you give us a little run through or example of what a session might look like? Mm -hmm. So let's say they're new-ish or new to me, I will spend like sometimes up to 45 minutes just talking about what it is that they're interested in, how they came to know me because I want them to be more invested in me as opposed to using me as a service provider, which I am, but uh, I prefer that dynamic as opposed to you give me a list and then I do it. I like to understand them and them to understand me. Mm -hmm. uh, and we go through what it is that they might be hoping to explore, or if they have no idea, then I will say that, all right, this is gonna be like an introduction to what it is like to interact with me, to be used by me, essentially. Mm -hmm. And after all of this talk, this discussion of interests, limits, and uh, introducing the safe word, the concept of the safe word, that they can use it if they need to stop, uh, whether it's psychologically, emotionally, physically, uh, there can be a traffic light system so that you can red, yellow, green it so that you can slow down. But when I first meet somebody, I prefer to just do the stop. And then um, I might tell them to stand up and undress for me because usually they've 
been sitting on the ground most of this time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you don't have to start like that, but uh, I kind of get straight into it. And um, yeah, and I'm just sitting there and then they're sort of getting a little bit like potentially humiliated like by undressing in front of me while I'm just sitting there fully clothed for a while. <laughs> me watching them very intently, telling them to fold their clothes correctly. I'm very into the protocol. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> Watch them figure out. <laughs> Most people can't fold. do it. <laughs> Most people can't do it. Oh, Watch them crumble. <laughs> yeah, and that sets a good tone. <laughs> Oh my god, I love that. <laughs> and then I might um, start to like, like uh, tie them to a chair. Yeah, might do things quite slowly. Yeah, to s- move them into uh, the slower rhythm of headspace that I prefer. Yeah, mm-hmm. so that they're paying attention to the way that I touch them, to the way that maybe the rope or the leather feels on them, so that they can start to drop into that space of intimacy with me. I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I'll start to probably just toy with sensation. So letting them feel what it's like to have my nails against them, having them understand what it might be like to have like the collar on them, leather or metal. Yeah. Just like, again, bringing them into their body, into space with me. I might start to toy a little bit with pain. Yeah, so that they can start to understand what it's like to challenge that barrier or to focus on stepping into a pain in order to honor my enjoyment. Yeah, create that sort of pathway also. Yeah, and I probably am doing this quite centrally, quite like, oh, so sorry, quite erotically almost. Yeah, so I'm not necessarily naked. But just the way that I'm with them, it's quite intimate. Yeah, I'm mm-hmm. quite happy to be like flesh, like my cheek against theirs or just talk to them very slowly and just bring them into the experience with me and then bring them out. Yeah, in a similar way, start to talk a little bit faster, start to like unwrap the things from them, ask them how they've been. Yeah, bring them back into just the average conversation level with me Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. so yeah I think it's for me it's about them being intimate with me and me wanting to get them to understand their place in my life that they're going to be useful that they're going to be there for my amusement that they are welcome to tell me what it is that they need or they want but at the same time these are my desires yeah and how I want you to experience those because that is how I want to relate. So I think that's my first session normally with somebody. And there's like a debriefing after when they're closed. And mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was so cool. Thank you so much for walking us through that. Oh, yeah, thank pleasure. you. But with the people who I've been with for a long time, like, all right, get down, take your clothes <laughs> off, get on that thing. <laughs> I want to try this new thing. <laughs> I love it. So the debriefing, is that the, like the aftercare or do some uh, relationships require more aftercare that you attend to, or do you not partake in Mm. that part? So the debriefing for me is my aftercare. It's seeing how they experienced it and knowing that they are going to be okay trying to integrate that into their day-to-day experience because it can be very um, much more intense, I guess, than how people normally relate. And also, again, it might be somebody's uh, very limited experience. And so they might start to form attachments and things like this. So I might use that time to measure how it is that they are processing all of these things. Mm -hmm. And then I would check in with them also a few days after. Yeah. Some people do cry uh, because of how releasing it can feel Mm -hmm. yeah to step into submission to find somebody who's accepting of you of that uh and so that takes that needs to have obviously a more tender turn yeah Mm -hmm. i might unwrap them faster than 
than I would have if they were not reacting that way. I might uh, have to reassure them more. I'll change my tone, mm-hmm. maybe a little bit faster. I'll bring them things so that it's less about just them giving me everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it, it has to change also, I think. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, that makes yeah. sense. Wow. Wow. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks again for walking us through that. That was so interesting. My pleasure. I think you can also just hire a dom and, you know. Yeah. That's true. Well, that's another true. way, actually. When I was first starting, I would travel around and I would hire other pro doms, professional dominatrices. Yeah. Just to like, it was research. It was also like hedonism, but it was also research. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's quite useful, you know, to be on the receiving end of that. You you gather a lot of information that way. Yeah. Yeah. So. No, absolutely. Is there like a general demographic that sees doms most or like professional dominatrices most commonly, or is it just like, because I think it's hard for us to imagine because it's just not something that is, I feel like, talked about often in, like, general yeah. daily life. But, mm. like, who goes to see a professional dominatrix? Most people. <laughs> no, it's probably not most <laughs> yeah. people in the world. But it's definitely a great cross-section of people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really? Uh, it's all genders. It's it's all socioeconomic. It's it's every it's everyone. I have seen all sorts of people who I meet at the corner store, who I like see driving a bus, who I probably would never have met. You know. Yeah. yeah. It's everyone. I think when it's a professional thing what can obviously change the types of people that you're seeing is who is simply in the vicinity, um, what your price point is, uh, because obviously that's going to make it more or less accessible to people. Mm -hmm. But that said, when I first started, I was uh, charging or the house was charging 130 Australian dollars for half an hour. And you would get more of a wider range of people, students, however, obviously from legal age. And then... uh, but now, because I've raised my rates quite substantially, it's definitely more rich men mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. that's who can afford it. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, they have still too much of the money in the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have a. I have started my own little podcast, actually. And uh, in, the, I think, in like two episodes, I talk about how I like to take money from rich men. Oh, so I love that. I'll send you that episode. <laughs> please yes, do. Please. <laughs> <laughs> but um, mm, what was I saying? I don't know. I was thinking about taking money from rich men. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I just, oh, that's that's a great all, all sorts. <laughs> all sorts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's, it's also how you advertise. If you shoot with like a lot of women, you'll probably end up having a lot of women who are clients. Yeah. So just what people see and respond to yeah but there i still have some i have this uber driver in uh, asia who will stay for a whole year to see me once it's so sweet oh my god yeah you know it's so like he's amazing so i'm I'm more more generous with that one yeah Yeah. i'll buy i'll buy him little outfits he says he's like just suffocation stuff like that so is that suffocation Sissification. So oh, it's um, to be uh, dressed in like a hyper femme sort of way. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow, a whole year. I know. Oh, that's know. nice. <laughs> I feel like this goes back to our like first question around boundaries, but mm. do people fall in love with you? Like, do your clients oh, yeah. fall in love with yeah. you all the time? A lot, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And you have to like kind of play with that in a, in a way because in a way that is why they keep coming back a lot of the right. times. A lot of people do have better boundaries, <laughs> <laughs> understand it's a professional relationship and that it's a service um, and they are the easier clients to have. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. But uh, they're, and they can also be regular because you're fulfilling a need. But uh, the ones that fall in love, yeah, that does happen. 
and the more money does tend to come from them also. So how do how does one manage that? Just always be clear about what is possible. Like I can always I can always just reiterate, you know. Yeah. But if it becomes obviously too obsessive, then they are fired. But right until that point, their money is good. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking yeah. Hell. Has anyone <laughs> um, ever tried to like dissuade you from seeing other people? Uh, a client? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Being like just you and me, like if they were in love with you. Mm, I think my clients know better than to try. To do that. <laughs> That's fair. Fired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, definitely people who like go on a, a like some dates with me and then we start to show themselves and then it's like, oh, you know, bye bye. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How does, <laughs> well, this is a different topic, but I'm mm. going to jump to it and you don't have to answer this question. Yeah. How does your dating life go on a personal outside of business? Mm, I've gotten much more picky. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because I've gotten so used to having people who are just responsive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I put up with a lot less shit now, you know? Yeah. People who don't reply within certain periods of it's just like I understand very quickly their place in my life. Because I've been valued for so long now, you know, even yeah. through money, you know. So it's like I also have a, a dollar amount, for better or worse, to my time. Yeah. yeah. And so if they're not giving me uh, something good to look at, <laughs> like mm-hmm. very lovely, like intellectual stimulation, like a combination and on a reliable basis, like, what? why am I wasting mm-hmm my time on you it's like this is like a thousand dollars of my time like god you know it's like <laughs> no <laughs> yeah that's incredible though that's such perspective because that's yeah. so true that's absolutely yeah. true that's no. back to the no bullshit like i feel like <laughs> yeah. that's just kind of like the through line in all of this is like mm-hmm. no bullshit yeah mm-hmm. I've, i waste less time now yeah yeah it's a precious resource time and mm-hmm. my attention mm-hmm which is a lesson I think we all need to learn too. Mm-hmm. It's like your attention and your time is so valuable. Mm-hmm. Own that and like, don't waste it. Don't let other people waste it. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. We have a very uh, limited amount of time mm-hmm. here. So what do we want to yeah. do with that? I guess is how yeah. I feel about it. Mm-hmm. You did enjoy that episode. And that is me demanding <laughs> this space. And, um, <laughs> Being a dominatrix. And you are doing a mighty fine job of it. Just Um, a PG version. (laughs) Our uh, electronics decided to demand that we stop recording (laughs) at a certain point as well. So we didn't get to ask Eva where you can continue connecting with her after this episode. Um, But she has a podcast called... (laughs) A podcast (laughs) called Tea Kink, T-E-A-K-I-N-K. And you can find her at evao.com on instagram she's at you will please underscore me and then on twitter and tiktok she's at you will please me um Mm. and that's exactly what you'll be doing so (laughs) definitely check her out (laughs) so thank you mistress eva for being on the podcast today i was truly floored when you said yes to coming on and i am still floored that i got to talk to you so thank you so much and thank you to our listeners for hanging out Yeah, you can thank us by heading on over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify to rate, review, and subscribe to Honey Do Me. You can leave a written review. You can also watch us on YouTube. Um, Mm -hmm. And if you ever have a suggestion or somebody you want to see on the podcast, we also have that linked in our bio um, on all of our social media. So you can contact us there. And that's all she wrote. So <laughs> you will stop listening now. <laughs> but come back next week. And that's yeah, you will come back next week. Exactly. <laughs> and the week after and every week after that. <laughs> Until we die collectively. So love you lots and we'll see you next week. Kisses. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> we needed something sweet after you said we're all going to die. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>